How you doing, YouTube? Matt with Massive Beer Reviews, back with another Massive Beer Editorial. Um, number five in the series, I think we're at now. Uh, chugging along. Um, touched on a couple different subjects so far. Um, today comes actually out of another kind of news story. Um, like I said, I had a laundry list of these to do. Um, but... Um, Sometimes stuff pops up and it kind of makes me think. Do you know what I mean? Last one I did that was when um, there was an article on actually um, BeerTube and uh, people that make YouTube beer reviews. So I figured I'd talk about that and then kind of give my thoughts on um, on uh, on BeerTube and what it means to me, what it appears to me, and what I think about it. Uh, this article, article is probably going to follow much the same format, um, but this one's more about um, beer people. I don't know how to phrase that, actually. Beer people, beer geeks. Not beer snobs. Oh, actually, beer snobs. But also beer geeks. And, and the things I think about people in the beer. And the reason why uh, who are into beer, or heavily into beer, we should put it that way. Um, and the, where this kind of thought process comes from is an article actually written by Scott Smith of East End Brewing. Um, a blog post, if you will. Um, uh, East End Brewing, Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. Um, I've had quite a few of their beers. Um, they actually make one of my favorite barley wines. Um, it's their gratitude. Uh, it's absolutely fantastic. If, if you can have it, find it, procure some, I implore you to do so. Great brew, little brewery out of Pittsburgh. Um, they, um, they, uh, had the opportunity to actually go to a kind of beer luncheon kind of thing in a filming, filming, uh, Parts Unknown with Anthony Bourdain. Um, Anthony Bourdain. I'm kind of, I got a little man crush on Anthony Bourdain. I have for quite a while. Um, I have, you know, read all his books, K Kitchen Confidential, all the books that he's written. Sans has, like, fiction stuff I'm not a big fan of, but all his kind of autobiography, kind of tell-all kind of things I like. I like his shows. Do you know what I mean? No reservations. They're fantastic. I've actually gotten and seen him live in the show, so I'm a big fan of Anthony Bourdain. Um, but he was doing a thing in Pittsburgh for um, Parts Unknown, and uh, I guess the people that he kind of hooked up with kind of were doing some kind of backyard kind of barbecue kind of thing um, with kind of cooking and things like that. So uh, whoever that was, and they're named in the article. So if you want to read it, go check out East End Brewing. Go to their blog um, post area to read the whole article. Um, and uh, they kind of uh, invited the Scott from East End Brewing and said, hey, man, come on down. And they're like, oh, you think I should bring some beers? And they're like, absolutely. So, you know, he goes and brings beers there. He brings some of his pedal, which I believe is their kind of session kind of IPA. And he brings some of the Burn Barrel League Gratitude. So I wish I was there. And um, and they start, uh, you know, they start doing a little loose filming. And he's kind of floating around the peripheral. And then, you know, they kind of stop filming and kind of move on to another section. And, and during that time, or to kind of take a break or whatever. And um, during that time, one of the people there, one of the people throwing the shindig kind of hand, Anthony Bourdain, uh, one of his beers, the Session IPA, he drinks an Ian, you know, he marks that, and this is a lot of paraphrasing by him, he actually goes out of his way to say, these aren't quotes, what he said, this is essentially what he said, so take this all for a grain of salt, when I say this, because I don't want to make it sound like I'm reading exact quotations, he basically said, ah, oh, that's fucking good, um, Anthony Bourdain said about the beer, and, uh, we'll hit the pause button there, and, uh, the reason why that makes... I don't know, waves, I guess you would say, in, in, in beer, is that there's a, a long-running kind of thing that Anthony Bourdain doesn't like crap beer, thinks it's dumb. I've never gotten that just only because I follow him that much. I understand kind of how his brain patterns work a little bit when he talks about things, so take that for what it's well. But, you know, it's kind of like one of those things where it's like he's always kind of pooped on crap beer. He hasn't. He poops on crap beer. He doesn't poop on crap beer. He poops on, like, you know, crossfitting and veganism in, in, in the kind of way that people won't shut up about it in a, in a pretentious way, I guess you would say. So, unpause. So, you know, and he says, oh, that's pretty damn good. And um, he actually, the guy who gave him the beer is like, oh, the guy who made it, oh, he's standing right over there. And I guess, you know, Anthony Bourdain kind of turns around and walks towards him and goes, before you even say anything, I, and I'll read that part just to give the paraphrasing part of it. He basically said, I don't hate crap beer. Exclamation point. Um, it's just that when I go into a bar, I go there to sit down, relax, and drink something cold. And maybe lose myself a little bit. Um, and what ruins it for me is the guy sitting next to me with 12 little glasses in front of him with a pen and notebook, fussing over every little detail and peppering the bartender with questions after question for five minutes. Um, and that's 
makes a lot of sense to me. Do you know what I mean? And it's kind of like the way I always thought that a lot of people were kind of poo on different things. Uh, it's kind of the way I think about things. Uh, maybe that's why I want to talk about it, because it kind of strikes a chord with me. Because I don't give a fuck about what people do. You know what I mean? As long as you're genuine. And I think, and this is just my thoughts, not what he's thinking, obviously, is the problem with that he has with people that are in a crap beer, or as, as he perceives them, because perception goes a long way. And the problem I have with a lot of fucking things is I think a lot of people are disingenuous. You know, like, uh, uh, you know, one of the people um, out there, I say a lot of things, all hipster this, hipster that, and hip, people look at me and, you know, assume I'm a hipster, you know, I have a beard and black glasses. And uh, um, one of the, um, I would say he's a, he's, a, he's a beer tuber, very loosely termed that way, uh, Yort from, a, uh, uh, actually, I forget his beer channel right now, huh? What, what is it called? Anyway, holy shit, I forget your He doesn't post it all, so I can't fucking... Uh, something bruisings. Oh, God damn it, you're going to kick my ass for forgetting. Anyway, strange bruisings. There you go, I remembered. Um, you know, he kind of makes bust my chops when I talk about hipster stuff. Um, and this is my whole stance on hipster things, is that I actually don't hate hipsterisms, or the things that mathematically equate in people's brains to being a hipster. I have friends that... If you look at them, they look exactly like um, a hipster. You know, they have you know the glasses, the beard, the plaid flannel shirt. You mean, know, maybe they play in a band. Maybe they play the banjo. You know what I mean? All the things that you would equate be like, okay, add up all these scores and they pass the threshold for being a hipster. But I, I some of them or roll out of bed, grab whatever clothes they have readily available to them, kind of run their fingers through their hair and leave their house and go do to whatever they're going to do. And they look like the guy who takes five hours to look like that. And to me, that's the big difference between a hipster and a non-hipster. You can actually look like a hipster, um, it, but not be one because you're not trying to look or be anything. You're just organically, that's who you are. Um, and there's some people that put large effort into being, looking, and in, in, in sounding like that. I think that's kind of where he's coming from. And that's kind of what this discussion is be, a, be about, is where beer is in perceptionally how I see things when it comes to the craft beer community, and more specifically the really deep, or people who want to be deep into the craft beer community and who, who want to be into it, um, but are putting so much effort, effort into it. To me, it comes off a little bit disingenuous. Um, it's one of the. It's a weird thing. It's a weird thing to kind of talk about because what you are is basically just straight up judging people based on perception. A lot of people would actually say that's you know you shouldn't really do that. You shouldn't really judge a book by its cover. Um, but you know stereotypes do exist for a reason. I'm not saying that's what they should be used as a judge and jury to um, you know I mean convict and to demean people. But when you're talking to something as trivial as trivial as a fucking being into craft beer, I'm not really going to get all that fucking PC about it. Do you know what I mean? It's fucking beer. Who gives a shit? Anyway, so, do you know what I mean? The whole concept of of, of being into beer has gone from a thing of, uh, of, of I don't want to say uniqueness, but nichiness. Very small niche-iness. Now there's a lot of niches inside the craft beer community, but it was a very niche thing. Um, you know, very small groups of people kind of just floated back and forth and talked about beer and yada, yada, yada. And as it's got bigger and bigger, it's gotten infinitely more popular to the point where it's starting to get very popular with specific, actually I was going to say specific groups of people, but it seems like it's getting um, popular across the board. Again, Crap beer only makes up 12% of the beer market, so we're not talking about the most popular thing in the history of mankind. We're not talking about the Justin Bieber's and Katy Perry's of the world. But what we are talking about is the is the thing that Anthony DeBrain kind of hinted towards. We're talking about the CrossFitters of the world. We're talking about the vegans of the world. Um, and there are, just like if anybody out there has spoken to these people, the vegans and the CrossFitters of the world, there's our people that are organically into those things, that are doing it um, and approaching it and enjoying it in a kind of matter-of-fact, this-is-who-they-are kind of way. And there's some people that are doing it and just can't shut the fuck up about it 
Not in, a, not in a good way, because sometimes I can't shut, shut the fuck up about it. I'm talking into a camera right now about it. That's how fucking weird this guy is. But there's some people who talk about it so other people can hear them talking about it, which is essentially what I'm doing right now, but it's a little different. You, you, can, you come here to listen to me. I don't force it on you. And that's the point I'm trying to make, is that people are just, like, talking at you about, uh, about crap beer. Um, or whatever it is, in a way that's kind of like, look at me, look at the things that I know. Or look at me, look at the things that I want to be involved with. And and, and that's kind of where I think the two things kind of, uh, kind of separate. There's a chasm, kind of a split, you know what I mean, between those two worlds. And I'm just going to try to kind of figure out, like, where that line is, where that line lies, you know what I mean, like, what does it mean, like, he actually talked about somebody actually sitting there and talking about writing in a notebook, I actually don't think that's a bad thing, I've never been a notebook guy, I actually had Excel sheets with, um, you know, before Untapped, and we'll get the fucking Untapped, but before Untapped existed, I, you know, had an Excel sheet with all the beers that I've kind of drank, so there is a kind of notebook portion of the show in it for me. But I've also been a very kind of mentally kind of like, let's re- try to retain this information for instant retrieval. I don't need a notebook to do that. Um, but the combination of the, you know what I mean, having 12 glasses in front of you, taking out a notebook and writing it down and asking questions at a bartender, if actually someone was doing that next to me at a beer bar... I'd fucking hate that person, too, to be perfectly honest with you. I shouldn't say hate, but I'd I, I believe they were just trying to look the part. You know what I mean? Again, that's me being perceptionally kind of douchey. You know what I mean? There's probably people that are just kind of weird and kind of... What's the word? Idiosyncratic? Syncratic? That's the word, right? Um, about it. And But I also believe there's a good portion of people out there who are into beer, or I keep saying are into beer... When I'm talking about these people, I mean, oh, and I said these people. When I'm talking about these people, I think a lot, a good portion of people that would go to a beer bar by themselves or with a friend and order a bunch of beers in tasters and write stuff and ask the bartender questions are trying to be noticed. They're trying to get people to be like, oh, look at me. This makes me kind of into beer more than the person that's sitting next to me. And that's, and that's kind of the, I guess, the riff it's going to go on. And this is basically going to turn into me, again, talking about the things that I find a little bit douchey about the beer scene. Again, you know, that's just me picking on people. What am I going to do? Actually, it's not picking on people. Because I'm not naming names. It's not a Seinfeld episode where I'm ordering Chinese food. It's just me kind of talking about things that kind of bother me. Let's put it this way. A little venting session again. Uh, so you guys get that. Um, there was a break in between those, right? I hope so. Anyway, yeah, so let's kick it off. These are the things that actually, like, that I don't understand about beer. And uh, that kind of piss me off and kind of irritate me and make me feel the same way that Anthony de Bourdain, Bourdain said makes him feel about craft beer. And I have a lot more of them. So, uh, so I don't know what that makes me. Maybe it make, means I hate fucking beer, too. Anyway, first things first. I don't really understand the obsession... With, I shouldn't say that. I shouldn't say I don't understand. I don't get. Let's put it that way. Eh, it's not true either. I do get it. Untapped. It bothers me. Why? Untapped. I actually think I haven't untapped. I don't fucking use it anymore for reasons I'll explain. But I just don't get it. For one reason and one reason only. And there's more going to be more than one reason. So don't say hey, you had more than one reason. Um. Two things. One, the obsession with the tick. You know what I mean? To actually, like, I have to have this many kind of ticks. I have to get the 2,500. I have to get the 5,000 unique ticks. I don't get it. I, in the sense that, I don't know. I, I you know, I've done it. I've, I've, I've done it. I got to the point where I actually started to get close to one of those milestone numbers. And I was just like, why am I doing this? You know what I mean? Like, it doesn't really mean much of anything. It bothered me to the end where I actually purposely stopped doing it because I felt like there was like some kind of weird kind of meaning to it that I just didn't want to give meaning to it. So it's like the whole like obsession with getting to a certain point and untapped. And I see it with people around me. And that kind of leads to the second portion of the show is the obsession to get every beer you have in there. 
Um, again, this is probably a lot of old guy stuff. This is probably a lot of like, oh, fuck this. What are these kids doing with this shit? But um, like the obsession to get every single beer into a tapped and not to forget and to get them in there as soon as you drink them, I think is one of the biggest, most detrimental things when it comes to actually social socializing with beer, period. Again, like I said, I've used them tap. I understand, you know what I mean? Okay, you want to use it for recording purposes. That's the big, like, heroin addict, crack addict excuse when it comes down to tap to be like, oh, you know, I use it to log my beers and, you know, I keep track of what I have. That's a bunch of fucking bullshit. You know what I mean? It's a bunch of fucking bullshit. You want to do it so other people see that you're drinking a beer and that you kind of do your whole kind of shtick on whatever the beer is. Or that you can show people that you've had this beer that they can't have. But it also, the big part of it, which I said, which I was kind of alluding to with the whole, like, one of the most detrimental things to beer, it's separating people from actually enjoying themselves and talking and conversing and, and being part of a community and being part of a group while you're in that moment, you know what I mean? Like like I said, I used to use it, and I used to be kind of like a person that did it for a while. And then I realized that I was, I was every time I would get a beer, I'd get a beer, and this is especially more, I guess you'd say, relevant when it comes to, like, bottle shares, because you're doing much more smaller portions of beer, so it's a lot more phone activity. But every time someone would get a new beer, they grab their phone, and they just start to untap the shit out of the beer. you got to take a picture, you got to write something, you got to rate it, you got to hit it, and then the person wants to sit there and just kind of scroll through and focus and, and kind of pay all their attention to their phone and not really give any feedback or any have any discussion with the people around them. They kind of just let themselves be sucked into the untapped vortex of got to get it, got to picture it, got to talk about it, got to rate it, and got to do all that. And, you know, throughout the night, you'd barely talk to somebody. Like I said, bottle share is infinitely worse because, you know, when you're doing a bottle share, you end up, you know, two, three ounces at a clip a lot of times because some of these beers, if you have a larger group of people, you know, it's pretty rapid succession stuff. So you end up being separated from the moment completely. Um, so that's one of the big things that kind of I think is like one of the one of the the irritations, I guess you would say, one of the same the Bourdainisms, I guess you would say, uh, about craft beer that kind of pissed me off. And that one's a couple of different reasons. It's kind of microcosm of all of it. Uh, you're not communicating, you're not in the group, you're not talking about beer, you're not enjoying beer, you're not conversing with your fellow friends about beer. What you're doing is basically just kind of in the same area as those people, but not there. While at the same time, just proving, showing to other people that you're drinking a beer that they or may may or not have happen, have had yet, which is like, you know what I mean, the whole like thing, ooh, i got to get this on tap first out of my friends because that, you know, means something. And I guess we'll get to that whole part in the end. So that's one of the ones that really kind of, I don't know, kind of, I don't want to say pisses me off, but just kind of saddens me. It's probably a way better way to put it. Um, the other thing, and this is a lot to do with social media. A lot of this stuff is wrapped up in so social media, so maybe that has a lot to do with a lot of this kind of angst that I have and other people may have, is um, is that everyone's after and also at the same time has the same rare beer. Um, you know, everybody's like, look at this beer that I have that that is super rare that you can't get, yet every third photo after that beer releases is of the same beer that everybody else has. It's kind of like, you know, it's the whole joke about Bourbon County Rare. You know, they're so rare that they make tens of thousands of them. You know what I mean? And that's the other thing about it. It's like, it's like everybody's in a rush to be first. It's like the, you know, the blog poster that kind of like or the commenter in a blog or an article that goes first. It, it's a lot of it when it comes to craft beer. It's like people want to be first and a lot of people feel like they're first. Not that it matters, because if you're first or last, it doesn't fucking matter. You know what I mean? As long as you enjoy it. And that's the whole, I guess, end theme of this thing is going to be. It's just enjoy yourself. Being first doesn't matter. Or being... Having that beer when somebody else doesn't have that beer doesn't make that beer actually taste better. That's another one of these. And I guess I'll just skip to that one real quick and kind of lump it into this one. Waiting, waiting in line doesn't make beer taste better. Um, I, I'm not sure if a lot of people actually know that. Um... But there's zero direct, there's zero correlation between actually the beer actually tasting better um, than it not tasting as good. You know, there's a separation from the two. There's an actual like psychosomatic thing 
where you're so you know hyped up for it, it has to be good, and combine that with the whole mentality of, well, you know, I'm having it, and I wait in line for it, so it's got must be good. So you kind of glom those whole big things together with like people who, you know what I mean, have to have the rarest spear that everybody has. It combined with the I waited in lines uh, complex, um, it, it ends up being this kind of superstorm of the beer actually not making two fucks difference. Whether it actually tastes good to those people, again with those people. Um, you know what I mean? There's a lot of people that don't give a shit about beer. Um, they just give a shit about having the beer or getting the beer. So if, if someone actually gets it um, and they don't seem to perceive it as something as rare and as coveted, then the beer miraculously starts to lose flavor and it starts to lose taste. You know what I mean? I can't tell you how many times I've seen this happen. You know what I mean? Like, you know, people from people actually going to releases to where they wait in line and have the beer and they're like, oh my God, this is the best beer I've ever had in my life. To like a week later when they notice that everybody else has the beer and be like, you know, at first I thought this beer was fantastic, but, you know, coming back to it, on second thought, I don't, you know, kind of maybe it fell off a bit and it was only good in the moment, but no, the beer is probably exactly the same fucking, unless you rode it, rode with it in the back of your car in 90 degree weather doing fucking donies, the beer is probably very close to what it was when it originally came out. The big difference is, you know, the kind of rarity, kind of high of the beer has gone. You know what I mean? So you end up having this kind of, you know, like, kind of fall-off of taste that's not actual perceptional. It's more mental than anything. Um, so that's kind of like the, the the kind of whole, like, line-waiting rare beer kind of mentality thing where it's like, it's a, there's no kind of like, okay, let's just drink the beer for what it's worth and talk about it and enjoy it or not enjoy it. It's more, you know, it, it, situationally and perceptionally is going to dictate whether the beer is good. It's not real. It's just, again, more of a kind of uh, puffing of the feathers, a plumage kind of thing going on with beer, where it's it's not about the beer. It's about the two hours getting ready for the beer. That kind of pees me. Gets me a little sad. I'm going to keep using that one, sad. Irritates me. Disappoints me, I guess you would say. Um, one big one, and I think we've all been subject to this at one point or another, but it still bothers me, and I try to, um, I try to give... This the I try to put perspective towards this one a lot because this is one I feel like I can do every now and then, so I'm not fucking immune to any of this shit. Is turning everybody's turning their nose up at easily attainable beer. Um, there's a difference between you know waiting in line beer and easily attainable beer. You know you're kind of mix of six kind of always readily available shelf beers. That's kind of a weird one for me because I feel like I kind of do that every now and then. Granted. A lot of your shelf beers, unless you play really close attention or buy it from a really reputable source, sometimes there can be a little bit of dodginess to it. You know what I mean? Dating, things like that, if you're not paying close attention. Temperature control can be a thing when it comes to that. But a lot of times we tend to be get a little bit kind of like, oh, I've had that before. Kind of complex. With a lot of kind of shelf turds, I guess you would say. I guess that's the, that's the uh, right kind of verbiage we should put on that. But, um, yeah, it, 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 it's one of the things that kind of pees me off. And it pieces, pisses me off about myself because, like I said, I can do that a lot. Um, there's a lot of beers. And I'm going to name some. Some people might not consider these shelf turds, but they are to me only because of the beers that I was originally into. But a lot of Belgian beers end up being a beer that I go back to that I go, why the fuck am I not drinking this beer? You know what I mean? Chimay, uh, Celebrator. Um, you know what I mean? Like... Uh, a lot of like some of the some of the no, more, Unibrew beers, um, so a lot of just a lot of the Belgian beers, some old English beers like you know, uh, Sammy Smith's Taddy, uh, not Taddy Porter, their old Yorkshire Stingo. Like all, these are all beers that are readily available on the shelves, but a, a smaller American beers, um, you know, like Oberon from Bells or like uh, even like Two Hearted or a lot of these beers that are like a Racer Five is a big one. You know what I mean? Of like a lot of beers that you're like, just like, forget about that shit. And eh, it's Racer 5 or it's fucking Chimay. Uh, you find it anywhere. And you have it. It's so fucking good. And it's like this kind of 
next level kind of like I'm never gonna buy anything off his shelf anymore. Uh, dude lives local to me. Um, he's actually have commented and made comments about that before going. You know, I went out and bought KBS, and and, and it was kind of like, oh my god, this is the first time I bought beer off a shelf in the past year. You know what I mean? Like ha ha ha. And and it, it's like it's like mentalities like that. It's it, it, it's like. There's so much good beer out there, and it, and it gets to the point where you're just kind of going back to the other one, where you're racing towards what's available, or you're race or not available, or racing towards stuff that can't readily be found because it has to be better because you can't have it. There's a lot of re these themes that kind of intertwine between some of the episodes I do on these editorials um, that it ends up becoming like even if the person doesn't know it, it tends to come off disingenuous. Like it's not about the beer, it's not about being true to yourself it's more about trying to be perceptionally different to somebody else and that's kind of like the whole n not good enough beer thing when it comes to people and you see a lot with social media and when i say that i mean on the fringes and the edges of social media I can't tell you how many times i've seen people take pictures of their refrigerators um with beers you know like it'll be like all these like can sticker cans in there and they'll take a picture and look at what i picked the other day and if you look back behind those beers at a focus you'll see your all day ipas of the world you'll see your sierra nevada pale ales you'll see your two hearted they never post pictures of those beers but they're drinking them obviously they're in their refrigerator um you know what i mean so it's, it's it's a kind of perceptional thing that people want to put this kind of elite kind of never never misstep i'm always on top of the fucking super hot beer game that kind of thing kind of hmm this kind of makes me a little bit kind of what's the word disappointed inside sad inside something like that um flip side of that script cash equals elitism um there's a whole sect of people out there that 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 basically they're buying super expensive beers and you know it tend to be and you know you know if you make good in your life and you have so much disposable income to where you can essentially buy do you know what i mean the best of the best you know what i mean that doesn't essentially dictate you as some kind of beer god or beer uh, whatever um but a lot of people think that way you know what i mean uh you know there's people out there that i know that all that they show um, is that they have, you know, can't own this, or do you know what I mean? Like Hill Farmstead that, or do you know what I mean? Like they go to every, you know, Dark Lord Day and get every variant, and then, you know what I mean, have every variant of this beer, of that beer, you know, 19 different variants of Hunapu, and you know what I mean? Go to, you know what I mean? Like, you know, every Belgian this and goose that and Lambic that. And there's only one way to do that. There's only one way to do that, and that is have a lot of money. That's it. There's only one way to have those kind of beers. Because it's not like you're, you know, it's a local place you're going into and you're trudging into there and you're, you know, you're, you're going to the place and you're buying and you're leaving. No. A lot of these kind of leap beers are spread throughout, throughout the world. And there's people that kind of hoard them and because they have, you know, so much disposable income. And then it seems like a lot of the people who fall into the previous category of wanting, you know what I mean, wanting the stickered can, fucking wait in line, I have to know his beer is kind of like, these are the, oh, these people really know beer. Well, no, they know, you know, really expensive beer because that's what their, you know, pockets dictate. They are, they can afford these beers, you know what I mean? They can, they can afford them, but it's like, it's like, you know, it's like seeing Donald Trump or, or, or fucking Rupert Mur Murdoch has, like, really good tastes because they're super rich and they can buy anything they want. It's not necessarily how it works, do you know what I mean? Not if you, you know what I mean? And, you know, whatever way you lean left, right, or somewhere in between, pick the other person instead of saying Donald Trump. I didn't mean to spout his name when it comes to it. Um, but it's, it, it, you know, it's... It, just because you could buy good beer doesn't mean you have good taste. And just because you could buy anything doesn't mean you have good taste. Um, you could be buying stuff that's been predisposed and, and talked about about being a thing that's very tasteful. And you could buy it. Doesn't necessarily mean you know what you're talking about. And doesn't necessarily mean you have good taste. So that's the other end of the spectrum. You know what I mean? There's the kind of getting into beer, kind of turning your nose down to regular beer. It still falls in a very small tax bracket. 
to the under end of the spectrum where it's like the person that buys only like super fucking uber crazy whales. But at the same time, a lot of times that has to do with how much money they make. So it's like, you know, just because you're well-to-do doesn't necessarily mean you have way better taste in beer. It just means you could buy beer that other people have deemed that are better tasting. So that's kind of another one that kind of grinds my gears. That's a good one. Or panties in a bunch. I can go either way on that one. Um, I went over and I have written here, lines dictate taste. I already went over that one. They don't. A beer does not taste like you waited for five hours in line for it. I know jo- uh, George from Mass Control Reviews would uh, would uh, would argue with me on that one, but yeah, I mean, lines, just because you wait in line, the beer doesn't taste any better, So, but we covered that part already. Um, not knowing anything but the present. That's one that really kind of kind of irks, irks me too. You know what I mean? Not that you have to be a beer historian when it comes to stuff, but if you're going to talk about Beer, and some people can even say this about anybody. You can say about me. You know what I mean? When I talk about beer, when I give out notes about beer, I could probably be a bit more in-depth or get a little bit more in tune with specific beers and specific flavors and specific styles. So I'm making my fun, fun of myself here a little bit if really if you're looking from it from a different perspective. But there's so many people out there that like when you talk about anything other than, you know, a, a pastry stout or a hot forward beer, you get a lot of, a lot of like, who cares about that shit? You know what I mean? It's like, motherfucker. You know what I mean? This is where shit fucking came from. You know what I mean? So it's like that thing where it's like, it, you can't act like you give 19 of the most flyingest fucks in the history of mankind about beer and not know anything about it. It'd be like saying, you love you love cars, but you don't give a shit about motors. You know what I mean? It's like the car, the car outside of the car. I guess you could do that. But then you wouldn't say you like cars. You'd say you like automobile design. You know what I mean? You'd be like, I like the shape and form of a car. I actually don't like cars. So, you, you know what I mean? You can't, you have to know a little bit about the beginning to know about the end. It's, it's, it's a balance thing. You know what I mean? You have to know what's bad to have good. You have to have happy and to have sad. You know what I mean? There's a lot of balance when it comes to everything in life. So, when, when someone's like so matter of fact or so hyped up or so um, kind of, you know, this is this is it, I know this thing, and this is it, but then you're, they don't know the other end of the spectrum, it's kind of hard to get a little bit not disappointed in such things, so, again, man, I'm bitching a lot, yeah, I'm gonna put out one that's just me saying all the good things about beer, I'm gonna have to get to that one of these days, uh, trading as a sport, that's the one that really bothers me too, um, you know, there's this one has been around for a while, when it comes to craft beer, it's a lot of people actually, um, Double fisted. Um, trading is a sport. There's a lot of people out there that trade just to get things and have the things, then end up trading the things for things to have the things, to trade the things to have the things. Do you know what I mean? Again, separated completely from beer. You know what I mean? It's like there's an old, like, I forget where it came from. It wasn't like a trading, it was like a video, and it was two computer people talking about trading beer from Beer Advocate and all that kind of stuff. And it kind of sums it up perfectly. Um, but it was just like, you know, a dude basically saying, you know, I have to trade this beer to get this other beer because when I get that other beer, then I had to trade these three beers for this beer so I can have these five beers and wait on them so then I can trade them for other beers. Drink the fucking beer. You know what I mean? Like, if the beer's that good, just drink it. You know what I mean? Like, that whole kind of like the seller that never goes away kind of kind of mentality or you know what I mean there's nothing wrong with hoarding beers do you know what I mean I have hoarded copious amounts of Thomas Hardy Ale over the years but guess what I've drank them all because they're too fucking good not to drink again there's a difference between aging and never drinking if I get you know if and when I get a new batch of Thomas Hardy I will get a case of it and I will throw it in my basement and I will let that sit for many many oh years and I will probably do that every year but they will get drank Sure, I might trade one or two, or I might open one or two, or send one or two to people that, you know, really, really want it, but it's not going to be a currency of like, oh, if I wait on this Hardy's case long enough, then I'll be able to get this, that, and the other thing for it. You know what I mean? Like, I understand getting what you want. I understand wanting something so bad, you, you want to put forth the effort to get it, get it. But it seems like for a lot of people, there's a never-ending kind of kind of want for those things and they, and it just they keep going and going and going to the point where it's like there is no end the trade is the addiction 
the trade is the thing they're into, not necessarily the beer. And that, again, tends to come off a little bit kind of endless, a little bit voidless, a little bit soulless to me. Um, and I guess, you know, the last one, well, gullibleness, I was going to talk about that too, but we've covered that in a lot of the previous editorials, that a lot of people are gullible, you know what I mean? They fall for a lot of things. They end up believing what they hear. They don't believe with their mouth. They believe with their eyes, and they believe with their ears, and they believe with their brains. Um, what they're told by brewers, by um, pundits, by whatever, that this is this and this is what matters, so you need to like this. But that's anything in life. And I guess I wrap it up, try to put a bow in this in the end, and and I guess this whole list is this this last part, but I guess I wanted to, uh, you know, I don't know, yammer in a camera, because that means something, and it is measuring your self-worth through beer. I see a lot of people that do that. Do you know what I mean? Like, it's like if they don't have it or they don't have it to give or they're not capable of getting it for somebody, then they get very, very pissed off. Do you know what I mean? I see that happen a lot. I see a lot of people that are like, you know, saying, been like, you know, I've been going to a lot of beer releases. I need to save some money. Or it'd be like, I'm drinking too much. I need to stop drinking. I'm not going to go on any of the beer releases. And then, you know, a week later, you know what I mean? You know, a brewery is like, oh, coming out with a beer. And they go, man, well, you know, I wasn't going to do that, but I got to go. Do you know what I mean? Because I got to be there. Do you know what I mean? Or I got to get it to give this person. Or any, I mean, you can go in 19 different directions when it comes to that. It's just measuring your self-worth through an inanimate object. Listen, you're talking to a guy. He's talking to a camera about beer. So I'm not going to sit here and, and say that, that shit doesn't matter. It obviously matters because I fucking give enough, enough of a shit to randomly talk to people on the internet about this you know what i mean so i'm not trying to say it's dumb or it's trivial but to kind of measure and to kind of kind of get a bulk of your self-worth through whether or not you have or had or can get beer is kind of super weird and kind of super sad and i see it it's like not even just like pits and pockets i understand everybody's community is different and maybe I'm speaking about ultimately what I see in my immediate community. But as of late, just to get a pulse on like a lot of what beer people are doing, I'm joining, again, Facebook is not the best place to kind of reference a lot of this shit. But I've been joining a lot of random Facebook, regional Facebook groups just to see what people are talking about. Just to get an idea of what people are th talking about when it comes to beer. I'm not even participating in them. And it seems like that's pretty much the fucking modus operandi of a good portion of the beer world is measuring, you know what I mean, who they are, measuring their dicks or v vaginas, vajays or vagines or your weenies or whatever you want to call it uh, through beer. You know what I mean? And it's it, it's an odd way to do such a thing. You know what I mean? For such a cool community, for such an awesome community, for such a giving community to be as, as to reduce to a kind of, you know, a dick measuring contest is kind of an odd thing. Um, it, but it, to go as far to be like, well, then that is how I am perceived, not just from other people, but by myself, is kind of a bummer. And I guess that's the full circle thing um, that, you know, Anthony de Bourdain was kind of talking about. This is what I take from it. So if I'm wrong, hey, Anthony, if you're watching this, which you'll never watch, that's what I took from it. And, and I think that's what he's talking about is that people kind of not enjoying the thing that they love you know what i mean like food drink whatever sports exercise whatever you're into you know what i mean and just enjoying it for what it is you know what i mean and just taking that thing that drew you into that thing and enjoying it and you know being the tree in the woods that falls that no one hears you know what i mean like enjoying the beer, having the beer, procuring a beer, drinking the beer, thinking about the beer, and never talking to somebody about that. You know what I mean? When's the last time you had a beer that was absolutely fucking bonkers that you never told anybody about? Sure, there, you know, I, again, I do this, this is what I do, I talk to people online, I tell people, basically I'm doing doing that online. Um, but outside of that, and sure, you want to tell your friends, oh man, this beer is great, but at the same time, just to do it so everybody knows you're doing it. It's just a weird thing. And it's a thing that should be enjoyed. Um, a thing that can be intimate at times, too. So it's like, it's a weird thing to see something that has become so 
social media wise. And so, um, more about look at what I did rather than I had to sing that was awesome. I, you should know because you will enjoy it too. It is is an odd concept, especially seeing how things have kind of progressed over time. So, yeah, I guess that's it for this massive beer editorial. And this is again, I'm trying to start a conversation here. You know what I mean? What do you think? Do you know what I mean? Does this does do you see that in your area? Is this what you see in your in and around your beer culture beer community? Um, do you see people doing this? Is it a dick measuring contest where you are? Is it more uh, look at me, look at what I'm drinking rather than hey this beer is awesome, you should try it because it's fantastic. Genuine kind of kind of sharing of community or is it more just you know what I mean? Like just you know, a dog and pony show. Do you know what I mean? Like it, it, do you see that? Is that perceptionally what you see? Do you see beer changing? Um, am I totally wrong? Um, are you local and think I'm talking about you and want to yell at me? Um, any of that stuff. Let me know. Let me know down below. Write me. If you don't want to write down there, you can email me at massivebeers at gmail.com. Uh, get at me in social media and Facebook, Twitter, Instagram. I don't use Twitter that much. Instagram. Facebook, Instagram. I don't even use Untapped. They always say Untapped. I don't even fucking use it anymore. Reach out to me up there. Anything like that. Let me know. Um, let me know if it's a valid subject or you think I'm just being a curmudgeon old man that likes to complain about stuff because that seems to be the norm in the last couple ones. Um, but yeah, let me know. Chime back. Say hello. Engage. Further the conversation. And uh, let me know if you enjoy these or not because I'd like to keep doing them. So hopefully you guys enjoyed this editorial. Hopefully you keep watching. And hopefully you tune in next time. Cheers. <laughs>